Hello, everyone. Welcome to this edition of the Clinton Donnelly Show. I'm really excited about the show. We're going to be talking to Chris Groshan, who I met at the Consensus Conference last year. And we had a really good, engaged discussion about the whole issue of fraud discovery and being able to trace the analytics to prove that a fraud or a theft had occurred. Chris, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Clinton. I appreciate being here, and I can't believe it's it's been almost a year. Um, it feels I like know. we've known each other longer than that, to be honest. Oh, with it you. really has. It's been a busy year. Hey, you know, I I gotta tell you, Chris. You know, one of the it's really sad. I get clients call me up, uh, or well, their prospects they call me up and they tell me a story. A woman told me a story about how she had never really invested in crypto, but she uh, had found some guy and. And he, she was very persuaded, and and it, it was kind of a complicated scheme. But basically, you put in fifty thousand, and then it doubles to a hundred thousand. Like that. And he takes some, and she actually took some money out. She took like a few thousand out, but then she kept on putting more in, and then she emptied out her four hundred one k, and she put that in there, and then she borrowed against her house, and she put more money in because she was so like astonished by you know, the returns she was getting and, and, and she believed this person. And then she borrowed money from her parents and she put that in there. Single mother has a child. Uh, and now then all of a sudden she discovers that it's complete fraud. Yeah. And you've probably heard the story so many times I have. And this woman was just on the phone in tears. Uh, she needed help uh, resolving the situation, file the tax returns because at one level she felt that she was experiencing a lot of returns, a gain, which would be taxable gain. Uh, however, be, and it's, it, there's a tax, there's a very interesting tax aspect to all these scams, and we'll get into the scams. In this case, it was kind of a confidence investment scam, but there's also people with romance scams, I mean, which is, I mean, it's shocking. I see people being indicted all the time on this, and, uh, and as well as regular phishing scams, where I call people up, where people call up and say, I saw the, somebody on my Coinbase account literally reducing my balances every minute. We watched it happen. I mean, just the, the shock of being scammed is so emotionally disturbing to people. Well, the first woman was financially ruined, financially ruined for years, ruined her relationship with her parents, her retirement, uh, her yeah. house. Uh, and yeah. other people just lost their savings, their retirement money. I mean, the, the horror and the shame. Uh, and then if they go on and they post information about it, then they have they, they humiliate themselves. And uh, it's, it's, it's a hard journey. But at the same time, well, these people then have to call me up and tell me the story and cry and all that stuff again. And I'm here to help them on the tax side because there's really a silver lining of all losses is some whatever you put in, you get to get you get to reduce your taxes or reduce the gains you otherwise experience, which is nice. But it's it's a, it's just a consolation prize when people call up and they actually have to be able to prove that they had the loss. That's a big challenge. How, prove to me you had the loss. Well, I had this money and now I don't have it. Uh, not good enough. And that's when people call up you at Constructive. You've been doing this a number of years. And, and both of us, I'll, you know, full disclosure, we're both members of the Digital Chamber of Commerce, helping people around the country uh, with these sort of situations. Tell me a little bit about, you know, about Constructive and, and, and how you help people. Yeah, thanks, Clinton. So, yeah, you're right. It is a big problem. Um, across the board, it, it the scammers have realized that it's um, that's what I'm looking for. Very fortuitous uh, of a situation where they can stay at arm's length and and they can basically apply crypto to existing scams or scam typologies. And basically now, because you know it's been you know, 10 plus years of being crypt crypto being in the news regularly that people are getting more accustomed to it and, and uh, understand it a little bit, just to the point usually where they can get themselves in trouble, right? That's the issue is um, everybody knows about it, but not everybody knows how it works. And, um, and so people are, you know, looking to get, like you said, they're trying to make easy money. And we all know there's no such thing as easy money. That should be the first red flag. 
Um, but yes, at Coinstructive, which I started back in 2015, I mean, our business model has changed over the years, but for the last four plus years, we've been, been offering services for victims of crypto fraud because the big problem, really the main, the main big problem is that victims don't know where to turn. There's a lot of recovery scams out there as well. So people who claim that they're doing what I'm doing for a living, um, and then they take advantage of folks. And those folks are competing on Google ads right now, currently. Um, I'm currently working with the FBI on, on recovery scam, um, assist, like informing them about contacts that I get when people are rec scam recovered or recovery scam um, involved with the recovery scam. And then they're building a database and going, starting to go after these companies uh, because they know they're, a lot of them are actually extensions of the original scam. So the original scammers set up a whole second business that's just dedicated to recovery. So once they realize that you can't get any, they can't get any more money out of you, all of a sudden you start getting contacted by all these other random people who say, oh, I can help. I can help you, right? I'll help you get your money back. Or I had a friend who got their money back by talking to this guy, go talk to this guy, right? So they just start to pass, they just pass you off. Um, and it's just the next, it's the next version of the scam, right? The scam is to help you, um, but they have no intentions of doing so. And they use some really great tactics to show you a wallet that they recovered because most people don't realize that all wallet addresses are public and you can just pull any wallet address you want and say, hey, we found your money. It's right here in this wallet address. Check it out. You just need to pay us 10% of the money. So we can cover the taxes and we can release it to you, right? It's the same, it's the same techniques, the same scam methods, but they're preying on people's inability to understand the technology or what they're being explained, or just simply um, just to be taken advantage of uh, because they're looking at the gains um, and they're not focused on what's happening actually in front of them because the numbers are so big and like they're being promised so much that that's all you can seem to focus on is the money, especially when that's when your number one focus is, is about the gains and getting a return on your investment. So yeah, it's a it's definitely a problem, and we like I said, we've been doing this for four years. We average about one one and a half cases a week, and uh, victims have been coming to us from all over the world. And we work with most of our victims are U.S. based, of course, but the biggest the biggest thing that we're trying to do when we help victims is explain to them their options because recovery doesn't always happen. Like recovering assets that are stolen from crypto is extremely difficult, right? The money moves quickly. There's no way to reverse it. Like um, you have to sometimes get cooperation from other crypto financial institutions in order to like actually um, uh, make any progress. So I think one of the big things that people need to understand is that recovery is not always the number one thing that we're trying to, uh, well, I mean, it's the number one thing that we're trying to help with. It doesn't mean that we're going to be able to be successful, nor is law enforcement going to be successful, right? So and part of the involvement of seizing assets is usually going through law enforcement. So if you can't convince law enforcement to carry the case all the way through, right, then it'll, bless you, it'll end up on deaf ears. Uh, it'll just go into this cavernous, you know, void and your case just kind of disappears. And for a lot of folks, that's not an acceptable path. Right. Like if I lost one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Right. Let's just say through a scheme. Depending on my net worth, I'm probably most people are not just going to drop one hundred and fifty K and be like, oh, well, it's just one hundred and fifty K. Not a big deal. <laughs> right. Like so you, human nature is to go back and try to get help. Right. Help yourself. If no one, if law enforcement isn't going to help you and you've exhausted all your possibilities, what's next? Where do I turn? Right. And that's when people usually get themselves into trouble. So that's why we that's why we, I established constructive uh, investigation services, because I want to get I give free consultation calls to people who qualify like for their and their losses so they can understand what the process is really about, how it works and what their options are. So when they do decide to move forward, that they understand 
what to expect so they can make a confident, informed business decision or a decision about how they want to proceed. That is such a big help uh, to people who are so lost in wandering. And it is tragic, the stories that we hear. Typically, if somebody, uh, it, you can't do a recovery because, it would, well, it might require getting the law enforcement involved, you still need to document that the theft occurred so that you can bring that to law enforcement. Otherwise, they just will take the paperwork. They, you have to actually show them a theft happened. What do your what does your team do actually technically, and what do you deliver to uh, the taxpayer to to bring to law enforcement? Great, great question. So a little bit about how we operate. Um, so I mentioned that we do these free consultation calls. That's the first step. Uh, talk to the victims, explain to them their options, and let them know how the process works. So how does the process actually work? So let's say that you are a victim and you have a bunch of your transaction hashes that you know that you sent all these transactions out to these to these scammers, right? You don't necessarily know where the money went after that, but that's okay. That's our job, right? Our job is to follow the funds. We're basically like forensic accountants at this point using blockchain technology to do the same thing, right? That a forensic accountant would do with bank statements and things like that. So the first step, right, after th this um, initial engagement is we, what we like to call the initial analysis step. Now, I, I'm gonna give you this, this um, scenario because the example that I like to use is very synonymous to car repair and everybody who owns a car, or knows somebody who owns a car, understands how mechanics work. Right. When your car is leaking or making some weird noise, you take it to the mechanic at the shop and then they give you an estimate to find out what's wrong. Because if the mechanic looked at your car, didn't open the hood and was like, yep, I think it's your transmission. It's going to be five grand. You would be like, whoa, 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 hey, hold on a second here. I think I'm going to go get a second opinion. Right. Or I'm just going to total the car like it's not worth five grand. Like there's no reason to replace the transmission. It's not worth it. So, okay, well, how does this relate to crypto, right? Well, in crypto, there's what we call the good, the bad, and the ugly. So in the initial analysis step, that is our, we give you an estimate of how bad it is. Other recovery companies or investigative crypto investigation firms will just flat out say, hey, here's our price, and then we'll do the investigation for you, right? And they're charging several thousands of dollars up front. And the answer after they start the investigation could be like, well, there's three things, the three answers that usually come out of in what we call the initial analysis. It's the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good is the money went to a subpoenable exchange, someplace that law enforcement is likely to get cooperation from or will be able to get more information about the money that went in, whether it left, if it's still sitting there, can it be frozen, who are the account holders, all of the stuff, right? That's usually a law enforcement uh, path, but we can also do a civil path. Right. So if you got nowhere with law enforcement, we can use attorneys to do what they're now calling John Doe summons or John Doe court cases when you're suing somebody you don't know. Right. And you're basically doing all the same things that the law enforcement agents were doing. You're subpoenaing all the exchanges. You're getting all the information because one of the breakdowns is that if law enforcement decides not to continue the case, there's nothing you can do and they won't share that information with a civilian like myself doing the private investigation work. So they know where the money went out of the exchange. They know what the next steps are. They're just not pursuing them. Either they don't have the bandwidth, they don't have the tools, they're told that this is not a big enough case to continue working on, whatever their reasons are for dropping the case. We can do the same thing on the civil side. It just costs a lot more money because law enforcement does it for free, right? That There's no cost, but you can't make them do more than they're going to. You can't twist their arm. There are no additional steps. If they decide that's it, that's as far as we're going, we're throwing our hands up, we're done with this. So as a victim, what do you do, right? Like, so the, the, the same path can be done basically on, um, on a, a civil side with a law, with a, a lawsuit. And then what you're doing is you're basically doing, a, like I said, a John Doe case, then you're subpoenaing the information, and then you can get the information about potentially account holders, where the money went, and keep progressing and following the money until you can track something down, things like that. So that those are the kind of the, the two options. But back to the, the initial analysis component of how this is like car repair, right? So, so, you, so you get an estimate 
<clears throat> of how much it's going to be to do this first step. And we come back to you and we say, hey, the good, the bad, and the ugly, here's what happened. The Some of the three of your 10 transactions went to bad exchanges, right? Well, they cashed out in places like China, Thailand, that are probably not going to necessarily be very cooperative with UN law, U.S. law enforcement. Now, it doesn't mean that, that they won't cooperate with U.S. Law, law enforcement. It's just that they're less likely to right? Because it's not a U.S.-based entity. It's going to take more work. It's going to take more effort. <clears throat> so that's why we call that the bad. Um, the good, I already mentioned, those are like U.S.-based exchanges or places where we'll cooperate. And then the ugly are things like tumblers, mixers, DEXs, right? Where the funds are going in, it's really hard to check, try to follow them, figure out what's happening to them, um, how they're moving, where they're moving. But those are the three kinds of things, right? That's the same thing if you went to a car repair and the mechanic said, oh, this is this car's totaled, like it's going to be expensive to fix, right? So if, if you're not given that option up front, though, then you're paying a bunch of extra money to, to be, maybe be, to be told, hey, these funds aren't recoverable at all. Thanks for your five grand, <laughs> right? Well, I could do the same thing for several hundred dollars instead, right? It's the same th concept as the estimate. The, the repair, right? Once you say, oh, okay, the money went here, the money went there, it seems like it's recoverable. All right, that's great. What is our next step? Ah, ha. Ah. Well, now that we know how much work is involved because we've done an estimate to see how big and involved the case is, because sometimes we look at, we start a case and it's two transactions. Oh, this should be a pretty easy, straightforward case. And then those two transactions turn into giant spider webs and they're split up and they're going all over the place. And then they're, they're going through all these different, you know, DEXs and they're swapping them from one token to another and then bridging it to another, <laughs> another blockchain altogether. And we got to follow it over there. So two transactions sometimes are very, very involved and could take just as long as 10 transactions. Right. But we don't know that until we actually start doing the work. So but this is the way we give everybody is open and transparent about where we are, what we're doing, what the next steps are, what the chances are likely of recovery, if at all, so that the individual, the victim is now informed about the situation every step of the way. Right. And they can decide, well, do I want to spend an extra, you know, maybe like a thousand dollars or $1,500 or more, maybe depending on the complexity of generating a report, but that's the repair part, right? That is the, okay, we know all the things that are wrong. We need to put it all together, right? And then, and then be able to hand it over as a written report that documents where everything went with annotated images. So you can, not only can you visually see all of the movement, but then there's documentation that actually describes each hop in between so that law enforcement can recreate the path themselves both visually and um, through through the, uh, the documentation that we provide at that point right law enforcement's job is to then run with it we basically led the horse to the water <laughs> right we can't make them drink but we can we can ask them to drink, <laughs> right? So we're basically at this point getting law enforcement to take look, take a look at cases. So because of all my connections over the last four years, years, what I can do is I can actually call up different field offices or different uh, branches within the government and say, hey, can you look at this case that was reported and give them information so that they can go pull it and look at it? Because like, it's just with like everybody else, right? Everybody's busy. Everybody's got a ton of stuff on their desk that they're dealing with. And imagine that you you get this new thing come in from somebody that you know, right? You're probably not going to get to it maybe right away. But this is how human this is how human beings work. If I called you up, Clinton, and I said, "Hey, I got this guy," you might squeeze him in a little bit earlier than some of the other appointments. Right, because we know each other and we have this relationship. Same thing with law enforcement. If I say, hey, can you please take a look at this? They might not get to it today, but you sure as heck better believe they're gonna get to it before they finish that whole stack of things that they got on their table, right? And that's the progress that we're looking for. That's where we're trying to get folks the help is that we can actually get law enforcement to take a look and, and maybe take some action. And that's really, that's really, the, that's the bonus. You, if someone's had a theft, they need to def, they need to prove that the theft occurred. 
which is what you're doing. And, and proving right. it means the documentation. generating a report that the layman, of, you know, the police or the FBI yeah. can understand this is what happened. It really did happen. Things went this way and that way. And, and that you need to be able to prove that. And from that, you now have something that you can go a couple different directions. You could you know, file insurance claim, whatever, or you go do a, you go try to prosecute, get your own recovery, work through the government to get a recovery. But you definitely need that to get a uh, credit against your taxes. So you need to be able to prove that you actually had the loss. Uh, yep. and, and we document it. that. Yep. At, at every step, every hop of the way. <clears throat> so we can say it started here, left the victim's wallet went to the scammers and then the scammers did all these things with them right and and that that way the victim has this also so yes law enforcement is the first place we usually send them to and then the second place is we say this is going to be the report that you need to prove that you actually had a loss for your taxes so then the same similar report would get would go to you and um, and then you would be able to access all the data and show I just, that you're police that you actually had a loss anybody who really had a loss would report that to the police so the step you both steps you just described are essential even if all you're doing is trying to get a tax recovery so yes the police report is the first step too even in in, in moving things along with the federal uh, agencies is they always want to see a local police report first and the, the problem sometimes the problem with the local police is that they don't they don't understand what you're giving them, which is why we write our reports for like a fifth grader, <laughs> right? If you can count and <laughs> if you can count and you can follow along, uh, you should be able to, uh, you should be able to figure it out. Uh, a lot of people are pretty overwhelmed when they see reports and data and blockchain because they haven't touched it before. Uh, so with all of our clients, we offer free um, free law enforcement consultation. So if you, it, there's two ways that we, after the report is complete, we either hand it back to the victim and we give the victim a list of instructions or procedures to go and file everything themselves and be their own advocate, right? Because there's two, because if they're hiring us to do it, we're going to charge them to do it, right? Okay. So. Um, so that's that's the thing is that there's, there's two ways to go about it. The victims can handle it themselves and run through all of the the filing and management of engaging with law enforcement, or they can hire us to do those initial steps, filing, engaging with law enforcement, and kind of being like a liaison for law enforcement and managing their case, kind of from beginning to end and working through the law enforcement with them. And then that way they know that they're going to get somebody who, who knows what they're talking about can, in, um, can kind of be that translator between the data that they're reading and m making it into common plain English so they can understand what, what they need to do next. That is so helpful. That's so very helpful. You know, I, one of the things that has shocked me is how frequently uh, a lot of people are scammed, not on a straight up investment, you know, like, you know, buy this Bitcoin, you know, it's going to go along, this crypto, it's going to go a long ways and they get, it's actually a scam. But there's other more sophisticated types. I, one of the ones that I'm always amazed by is what's called a romance scam, which involves cryptocurrency. How does that play out? So... The romance scams are 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 really brutal um, because they're taking advantage of people in two ways. And there's another the other name for romance scams is also pig butchering. Um, I'm not sure if you've heard of that term before, but that's kind no. of the new term that's been going around because uh, a lot of these romance scams are starting in Southeast Asia and. There, I can't remember the actual term, but they have a um, there's a Chinese word that they use for these scams, which translates to pig butchering, which means they're they're building the confidence of the victim, fattening them up for the slaughter, right? Which is get them to give you as much as they can, and then cut them loose. So, so the romance scams are particularly um, uh, awful because. There's two things going on, right? There's the confidence scam, which in general is just 
hey, gain trust so that you can get somebody to believe you into doing whatever you ask them to, whether that's send you money directly or go to a platform or whatever it is. Right. But the second part of this is that there's an emotional tie because there's a romantic relationship. Right. Now, ever since, especially since COVID, right, online dating has always been a thing. Right. Since, since, since the Craigslist, when there wasn't even like <laughs> dating sites, there was just personals, right? Like in the, with the newspaper. Right. So, you know, but from, from that point, now we have all these different dating sites and apps and you can just connect to people anywhere in the world. And that's how they get folks, right? Is they, they get people on dating apps, they start communicating, they move them to a, a private chat channel that's encrypted like Telegram or WhatsApp, where those, those messages can't be even seen usually by those companies. So subpoenaing those companies doesn't necessarily help. And the problem uh, for these victims is that they're so emotionally attached that they basically do whatever the scammers tell them to do. And even after they realize they've been scammed and that the money is gone, they still think that there's going to be some sort of relationship or they're going to be able to like have like connect back with this person. Sometimes the people go, okay, I get it. I just, I've been totally had because they stopped talking to them. They cut them off. There's no way to get a hold of them. But there's two things going on, right? There's the financial loss, and then there's all the emotional trauma that the people are dealing with. And a lot of times what happens is, and as the victim conflates the two, at, um, because they're happening at the same time, right? And they're, they think that this is all one big thing. But in reality, it's two separate things. The financial loss, because what happens is over time, usually victims come to grips with the financial loss, they go, okay, well, I, I'm not going to, I'm either, I'm not going to get the money back most likely, and I'm just going to have to move on with my life. But for whatever reason, like money doesn't necessarily always have the emotional attachment to it. Um, it can, but the actual relationship is what really messes people up because sometimes they've been talking to these people for a year, a year and a half, two, three years, right? And it's a slow con. So all of a sudden, how, I mean, if it was in a really, if you thought you were even in an online relationship for a year, the amount of attachment you have to this individual, right, is devastating. So now you have no money and potentially like lost all of your money or most of it. And this emotional support is gone. Like this person that you were in love with is gone, right? Like the emptiness that f you feel and um, that just, overwhelms you can drive people to things like suicide right and wow. the mental health issues around this, because like imagine feeling completely fail like a complete failure and a loss and depending on your age right if you're 70 or 70 plus and you're in retirement and you lost all your retirement and you've never had to think about being on public services or medicare or any of these things like you don't know what to do. You don't know where to turn. You don't know how to get access to these things. This has not ever been a part of your plan. You're like having to rebuild your life and starting over at like age 75 or 80. That's not, that's like not a people. A lot of people just say, this is what I don't see. I don't see it getting any better. I don't see a way out and they end it. And that we, we should be doing better as an industry, right? And, um, you know, I wasn't sure if I was going to mention it, but I'm also launching a nonprofit that's going to be helping victims because as a, as constructive as a for-profit entity, we work with victims who can pay for our services because if, if we worked only with people who couldn't afford, and there's plenty of those people out there who we do help occasionally, but we just can't work always on a pro bono or a contingency basis because then eating and paying my my rent or mortgage would be contingent also, right? So it's not a way to build a business. So we help the people that we can who can afford our services. But there's a whole class of people who need access to low or no cost services, as well as access to mental health services because they need to talk to somebody. And then you were mentioning people crying on the phone. You're, you're a tax specialist. I'm a, basically a forensic accountant. Like I'm not equipped to deal with the emotional stress and trauma 
or even like the suicidal tendencies of a victim. I need to be equipped to sh tell them, hey, here's access to services. Here's where you need to go. Here's somebody you can talk to, right? Because at the end of the day, my job is to try to help them recover the money, get them in contact with law enforcement. But I can't just ignore that these people are going through all this emotional you know, stress and trauma. There needs to be a path for them to, to access uh, help. So that's part of what the nonprofit is doing. It's going to provide three things. And the, the nonprofit's called the Crypto Recovery Alliance. Uh, uh, you can visit the website at cryptorecoveryalliance.org. Uh, we're not taking victims yet. We're still working on our legal status and uh, getting formed. So I'm hoping sometime here in Q and Q2 will be launched and, and going and we'll be starting to help victims. But the goal, right, like I mentioned, is you, we got to get people the help that they need. So the three things are no cost investigative services for people who qualify financially, access to low or no cost mental health services, and then preventative education so that you can understand when you're being targeted again. Because once you, there's no like check the box to opt out in the scam world. Once you're a scam victim, they have your data. When, if they can't get any more money out of you, they sell your data and package it up to other, other scammers who will then target you for years and years because they know that you give money. And if you give money, there's always a chance. And if somebody can get $1,500 out of you and they live in Indonesia, that might, that might give them enough money to last three or four months. Right. So wow. it's, you, you kind of have to put things in, in, in a complete perspective to understand where, where you need to help folks, how they need to be helped. And what's the best course of action for them based on their situation? Well, that's going to be a very exciting uh, nonprofit when you get it started. And I hope you get funding for all that because a lot of times people, when they're in that position, they don't have the money. Uh, and as you described, the mental wherewithal to really see the path forward. Hey, it's been really exciting to have you on the show, Chris. Uh, I want to tell everyone, uh, you know, if you have an issue with a loss or a fraud or need an investigation, Chris, how can they reach you? So the best way to get started with uh, with us is to visit coinstructive.com. And on the home page or on the investigations page, there's a button to open a case. And essentially, if you click the button, what you're going to do is you're going to find yourself sent to a survey. You complete the survey, and after you complete the survey, you should get an automated email that, if, as long as you qualify, you will get an email stating, here's a link to book an appointment, a free consultation, right? And then it's a Calendly link, and you basically get to pick anything available with, on our calendar that works for your schedule, and then you'll get a 15-minute consultation. Uh, sometimes they run a little long. But basically, we, we promise a 15-minute consultation for free, and that basically is to just get you started so you can understand what your options are, um, where, where we're going with the whole thing, and how, it might, how much it might cost so that you are fully aware and, and understand what your path forward is so that you don't get scammed again. And so then you can take, th you can take things like the report to Clinton, and he can help you actually uh, solve your, your tax loss and, and work that into your, to your taxes for the, for that year. Well, thank you very much, Chris. Thank you for the work that you do, the nonprofit that you're starting and how you help people. And, and I, you know, I've worked with a number of clients that have worked with constructive and I think it's going to be important for people to, if you have a loss to document it, define it, don't hide from it, don't live in shame, but move forward, own it document it and move forward with your life so thank you very much for being on the show chris if everyone if you enjoyed the show if you could hit subscribe like follow i appreciate it very much and please reach out to chris if you have a need thanks very much everyone and remember taxes are sexy <laughs>